So yeah, today I'll be talking about some uh, constructions, some new constructions of high dimensional expanders um, that I have with Ryan. This is like, you know, um, wait, wait, how do you hide? <laughs> hmm, okay, this is, okay. So, uh, so the idea with high dimensional expanders is uh, to generalize this phenomena of expansion in graphs to higher dimensional simplicial complexes. So if you're not familiar with simplicial complexes or you're rusty on expanders, uh, don't worry, I'll define all of that in a couple of slides. Uh, so these objects have, had, have motivated a bunch of recent results. Uh, so they've recently been used to construct improved quantum LDPC codes. Uh, they showed up in this, the proof of this 30 year old, 30 year old conjecture of Mikhail and Vazirani uh, concerning the expansion of the basis exchange graph of the matroid, if you're familiar with that. Uh, and even more recently, they, they've been used, or related ideas were used to construct optimal locally testable codes. So this is uh, a very a recent breakthrough. And it's, it's so recent, in fact, that uh, the first talk on it is today at one o'clock, so right after this talk. Um, okay, so despite their utility, there are only two examples of these things uh, known. So in this talk, I'm going to start by giving an overview of what high dimensional expanders are and how you can use groups to construct them. Um, next, I'm going to go over this construction uh, given by Kaufman and Oppenheim, um, which motivated some uh, recent results of Ryan and I. Uh, so at the end of the very end of the talk, I'll lead into uh, several new families of, of high dimensional expanders uh, that I have with Ryan. Okay, so let's start with expander graphs. So these are highly connected but sparse graphs. So think of D regular graphs, each vertex is D neighbors, where D is some constant like six. Okay, so we can quantify this as follows. If we have some undirected graph G, then we can measure its expansion by looking at the set of eigenvalues of its adjacency matrix. So its adjacency matrix is some real symmetric matrix and therefore has real eigenvalues and it's not difficult to show that the largest eigenvalue is going to be D if you have a D regular graph. And for this to be an expander, uh, we'll want that all the other eigenvalues are bounded away from this largest eigenvalue. So we say that G is an epsilon expander if the second largest eigenvalue is at most epsilon times D. Now high dimensional expanders are going to be an analog of this, uh, for higher dimensional simplicial complexes. So for the sake of this talk, we're just going to focus on two dimensional simplicial complexes, which are just one step above graphs. So you can think of these as being graphs with a set of distinguished triangles, okay? And to make things nice, we also will assume that each vertex and each edge will actually participate in at least one triangle. So you have some picture like this here. Yep. Oh, not necessarily. Oh, and I mean, maybe this is misleading because it looks very planar, but these things can be very messy in general. Uh huh. Oh no, it's like locally 2D, but no, yeah. It's, yeah, just because they're triangles, it's 2D. Uh huh. And there are some triangles. Yep. And you were saying you you distinguish you distinguish some some subset of these triangles. That's right. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Um. So we're going to be talking about this notion of local spectral expansion in this talk. Um. There are a couple of different definitions of high dimensional expanders, but 
this will be the one for us. Uh, so for this, I have to introduce one more thing, which is the link of a vertex in the simplicial complex. So if you take a, a vertex in your complex, we define its link as the graph obtained by first looking at all the triangles that it participates in. So just look at this set of triangles and now delete your vertex from those triangles. Okay, so in this example, you got some path. So we'll say that given some epsilon, which we'll want to be less than a half, uh, a simplicial complex is an epsilon high dimensional expander if its underlying graph is connected and the links of all the vertices are epsilon expanders. Okay. And really, we're not interested in one simple, one epsilon expander. Uh, as with expander graphs, we're interested in a family of growing simplicial complexes, so a growing number of vertices um, that are all epsilon expanders. And to rule out uh, sort of trivial things, and I mean, this is really only very, this is very interesting when we talk about bounded degree, uh, so sparse, simplicial complexes. So we say that a simplicial complex has bounded degree um, if each vertex participates in some constant number of triangles. Okay, we're imagining this is a fixed constant for the family of HDXs. Yep. So this means that all these links are gonna be like bounded size graphs. Yeah, yeah. Um, but they'll still be expanders, just not like Yeah, and this is this is actually yeah this is a something that's worth noting. Um, yeah, so so you could have in your construction like all of the links might be like the same graph even. Um, so um, it's not immediately like clear how the how these generalized expander graphs, um, but. Uh, I, I don't think so. Yeah, I don't think so. I don't know. I don't. Mm. Um. Yeah, yeah, I guess assume assume all the links are regular. Yeah. Assume yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. it, yeah, exactly. So it could end up being that that these links are like like very Maybe kind of dense graphs right. as you in, as you make this epsilon better and better. So it's this funny thing where the links can be um, can be expanders, but for for not very complicated reasons. Um, but there's this theorem due to Oppenheim, uh, which shows that uh, if you have an epsilon high dimensional expander. Uh, then its underlying graph is actually an epsilon over one minus epsilon expander. Okay, so the underlying graph of these things uh, give expander families. Um, and one consequence of this definition, or one property that these high dimensional expanders have is that uh, the random walks on their faces mix quickly. So, if we consider what happens uh, with expander graphs or graphs, um, you have this random walk on the vertices that uh, starting, uh, starting from some vertex, you select a random edge containing the vertex, and then you select a random vertex contained in that edge. Okay, and you repeat this a bunch of times. This, this gives you some random walk on the vertices. And if your graph is an expander, uh, modulo some detail about also wanting to bound the smallest eigenvalue, then, then after a small number of steps in this random walk, 
you can expect to be at each vertex with uh, roughly the same probability. So this walk mixes quickly. Um, in high dimensional expanders, the uh, analogously defined random walk on the edges also mixes quickly. So here, uh, starting from some edge, you select a random triangle containing it, and then you select a random edge contained in that triangle. Okay. And, uh, and this will mix quickly if you have a high dimensional expander. Okay, so first question is, do like epsilon high dimensional expanders exist? Um, well, first, do expander graphs exist? Uh, the answer to this is not, it's not difficult uh, to show that the answer is yes. So if you take a random D regular graph, then it's probably going to be a, a really good expander. So almost, almost any uh, random graph is a great expander. And so maybe a more interesting question is, can you give an explicit deterministic construction of, uh, of an expander graph family? And here there are also a bunch of constructions known, uh, some of which are more algebraic, like the Ramanujan graph construction of Lubotsky, Pilt, and Sarnak, or the original uh, explicit construction of Margulis. And there are also uh, more combinatorial ways of explicitly constructing these. Uh, so like using this, uh, the zigzag product of uh, Reingold, uh, Padan, and Wigderson. Uh, so for high dimensional expanders, it seems much harder to get any anything though, like not even explicit constructions, just knowing when these things exist. Uh, so the first example of these comes from thing, these things called the Ramanujan complexes, which generalize the machinery of the uh, Ramanujan graph construction. And these, this is quite a, a group theoretic and uh, algebra intensive uh, construction. Okay, and after this, there is this uh, much more, a, a, ver a very elementary construction actually given by Kaufman and Oppenheim. Um, and this is sort of the starting, the starting uh, for my work with Ryan. Yep. When you say elementary, um, you mean like it has a short proof or what? Uh, it, it does have a, yeah, the proof is pretty short and it doesn't require like a ton of background and like representation theory and stuff yeah so just like linear algebra facts basically um and if you're interested at the end of the, this talk to i uh, see see for reference on this i would suggest this paper this exposition of harsha and Safarishi, um which gives a, a much simpler proof actually that this thing is a high dimensional expander uh, than the one originally given by Kaufman and Oppenheim. Uh, so, as I mentioned, expander graphs, these are random things. Uh, they're, they're like pseudo random objects. Um, and I mean, I the two constructions I've, I've stated so far for these HDXs have been like group theoretic. And you can ask, you know, are there, do you have some model for random simplicial complexes that gives you high dimensional expanders, um, or do, do these HDXs have to be, are they like very structured things uh, in, in contrast to expander graphs? Um, so maybe the first thing you might think of if you wanna produce a random simplicial complex, um, maybe you just consider the complex where you put down a triangle, um, you put down any triangle with the same probability P, okay? And if you want this to be a bounded degree uh, simplicial complex, you should take P to be something on the order of one over N choose two. Okay, so now, I mean, what, what happens when we do this? So if you look at like, look at what happens at a vertex, it's contained in some triangles and you've just selected like a few random triangles to contain that vertex. So the link of this is 
probably going to be a very disconnected graph. So this, I mean, the simplest thing you might think of doesn't work. Um, and in fact, uh, I mean, there's no random model known. And I, I think it's like a folklore conjecture that random models, there's not a natural random model that will give you high dimensional expanders. So uh, something else I want to convey is that this local condition on the links, um, it might, I don't know, it might not seem that strong, but um, in general, when you impose local conditions on links, it can, it can be very strong. Like you can, it can be surprisingly restrictive. Uh, so as an extreme example, imagine you have a two-dimensional simplicial complex and the link of every vertex is a six cycle. Okay, so what simplicial complexes can you get? Well, it turns out that you can either have a triangulation of the torus or of the Klein bottle. Okay, so this, this local condition, um, I mean, in this example, this local condition like determines everything globally. And, and it seems like this condition that our links are expanders is also very strong, but I mean, there's, it's not known how to like quantify this at the moment. So we, we would, it's natural to look for structured objects to produce high dimensional expanders from. And some of the most well-structured objects in math are, are groups. Um, so it's natural to try to produce these things from groups. So a question you can ask is, given some infinite family of finite groups, is there some way to associate each group in, the, in this family to some simplicial complex in a way that gives an HDX family? So there are two questions at this point. Uh, first, uh, what are the groups? And second, how do you get a simplicial complex from a group? Okay. Yep. Wait, so, sorry, that, that might be a silly point, but like, can this be a sphere as well? I no. Mean, so it has to have some point in a five cycle. If you want yeah. This, uh, this is like if you, yeah, okay. soccer balls, like, have, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. Um, yeah. It's, it's cool. Um, so are there any, any more questions at this point? Okay. Uh, so what are the groups? Um, well, there's, in general, this is a hopeless question, but there are some like basic building blocks for the groups that are very well understood. Uh, and these are the finite simple groups. So, uh, each, every finite group can be built out of these finite simple groups. Every, finite, every sim, finite group can be built out of these finite simple groups by doing things like taking direct products and uh, semi-direct products and more complicated things. So it's often natural when you have a question about finite groups to think about it in the context of uh, the simple finite groups. And there's this amazing theorem, which tells you that if you have a finite simple group, it is either a cyclic group of prime order, uh, an alternating group. So think of like the symmetric group, if you're, you're more familiar with that. It can be uh, a group of Lie type, whatever that is, or it could be one of 26 sporadic groups. Okay, so 
now we want to uh, carry out this program of taking groups and making high dimensional expanders out of them. So uh, unfortunately, the, the cyclic groups are just too simple for, for this purpose. Uh, the sporadic groups are not an infinite family. Um, so this leaves us with the alternating groups and the groups of weak type. And for, and for this talk, we'll talk about a couple groups of lead type. So what are groups of lead type? Well, you should think of these as being like the finite field analogs of uh, matrix groups over the real numbers or over the complex numbers that you might be more familiar with. So the, a good example to keep in mind is the, the special linear group, uh, the group of determinant one uh, n by n matrices with entries in your finite field um, FQ. And throughout the talk, I'm going to assume that Q is uh, this prime power P to the M. Okay, now to be 100% correct, I, I mean, I should put PSL there. SL is not a simple group, but this doesn't matter in this talk. Um, and in this talk, I'm going to frequently um, identify elements of this finite field FQ with polynomials um, in some variable X with coefficients in FP that have degree less than M. Okay, and if you're not familiar with how this identification works, um, I encourage you to actually just think of FQ as being like the set of coefficients in FP. Think of your finite field as being that. Okay, so this group SLNQ has this some particular generating set, which will come into play later. Um, it's generated by matrices of these, the three following forms. Um, so, oh, uh, whoops, that should say three, not N. Yes. Um, so this is SL3Q. So, I mean, these are all determinant one uh, matrices you can check. And so here for every, for some element in your, in your field FQ, you can look at this, these matrices XI of T, which are just going to be the identity matrix plus some matrix that has zeros everywhere, but in one position. And that, that will be your element T. Okay, and it turns out that um, even when you restrict the degree of this uh, field element or polynomial to be at most one, uh, matrices of this form generate SLNQ. So by taking arbitrary products of these things, you can get any determinant on matrix. Okay, now uh, in, uh, something, a, a group you might be less familiar with is the symplectic group of four by four matrices. Uh, these are the four by four invertible matrices that preserve some skew symmetric bilinear form. So, I mean, concretely, they're the matrix four by A, so that A X A transpose is equal to X, where X is this four by four matrix that we split up into two by two uh, blocks. And we, we want the upper uh, left hand, upper right hand corner to be the identity matrix and the lower left hand corner to be minus the identity matrix. Um, and, and this also has some particular generating set, which looks kind of similar to the previous one. So again, you have like three types of generators. Um, and, and again, um, when you restrict the degree of the field element to be at most one, these still generate the entire group. Okay. And it, I mean, these generating sets are actually chosen in a very careful way, um, which I'm not going to explain. But uh, one thing to note is that if you look at any, any, any two matrices of the form XIT, where, where I is the same, um, they commute with each other. So if you look at the subgroup generated by, like, say, this matrix X3 of T as say T runs over all degree one things in the field. And this is going to be uh, 
isomorphic to the direct product of your field, uh, the field FP with itself. Okay. Okay, so I've said a couple of groups now. Um, so how can we get a simplicial complex from a group? Um, we can do the following thing. So let's take a group G and take three subgroups of it. Let's call them H1, H2, and H3. Now we can look at the following simplicial complex. So you're going to have vertices for every coset of, of uh, H1, uh, of H2, and of H3. Um, and we're going to draw a triangle between three cosets whenever they, they all have a common intersection. Okay, so one first thing to note about this is that um, because the cosets of a subgroup partition the group, if you look at, for example, the H1 cosets, I mean, there's some partition of G, and so you know, none of them overlap with each other, similarly for the other subgroups. And so if you have a triangle in this complex, it, it will involve one H1 coset, one H2 coset, and one H3 coset. So it's a tripartite simplicial complex. Okay, now to do an example, uh, let's take the group G to be the direct product of Z5 with itself uh, three times. Let's take H1 to be the subgroup of elements where the first entry is zero and the other two can be arbitrary. And similarly, for H2, we demand that the second uh, and, the, and for H3, the third coordinate should be zero. Okay, so what is this uh, simplicial complex? Well, the cosets of H1 are just, they're just translates of, of this, of H1. So you take some element ABC, you multiply it by H1, and you get all a set of elements of the form A and then some arbitrary second and third coordinates. Okay, so, so the H1 cosets are just uh, like these slices where you fix the X coordinate. Uh, so if you, if you, you know, um, if you plot these, uh, if you identify a, a, an element of, I mean, plot the coordinates for something in this group, like in R3, you got some five by five by five grid of points. And now the H1 cosets are just going to be like these green slices where you fix the X coordinate to be something. Uh, the H2 cosets, you fix the Y coordinate to be something. And the H3 cosets, you fix the Z coordinate to be something. Okay, and um, there's a triangle between one of these green slices uh, a red slice and a blue slice whenever they all in intersect. Um, and so in this case, I mean, any, any three of these slices will intersect at one point. And so uh, you get the complete tripartite uh, complex. Okay. Uh, so recall, we're trying to somehow make I mean, this isn't a bounded degree thing, so this is not what we're looking for. Recall that um, we're looking for uh, a simplicial complex uh, whose underlying graph is connected and where the vertices of all links are epsilon expanders. So the first question is, when is the complex X connected? Um, and it's not difficult to show that uh, X will be connected if and only if these three subgroups, uh, H1, H2, and H3, generate the group G. Okay, now we also wanted um, a bounded degree family of simplicial complexes. So what does this mean? Well, for the bounded degree part, notice that if you take a coset of H1, say, it has, it's, has the size equal to the size of H1, and so it most the size of H1 cosets of H the cosets of H2 partition the group. And similarly, for the um, number of intersections of this coset with cosets of H3. Uh, 
And therefore, the, the maximum number of triangles you can have containing this coset GH1 is equal to uh, the size of H1 squared. Okay. And so if all of your subgroups have some bounded size, then each vertex is contained in some bounded number of triangles. Okay. And the number of vertices in this complex is just given by the number of cosets of these three subgroups. So if the size of the subgroups is bounded, then just as long as the size of this group G is growing, you get some, uh, some, some family of simplicial complexes of, of growing size um, with bounded degree. Okay. So now I'll let you think for a minute. Uh, if you can come up with any examples of a family of groups that's generated, finite groups that's, that are generated by a few subgroups of some small size. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the the subgroups. Oh, sorry. I got. I got yeah. This. Yeah. I guess they're generated by a few elements, but when you look at. Yeah. Okay, I think I think something like this does work. I don't, yeah. Um, that'll, um, yeah, uh, well, that's two subgroups, but the, the, yeah, they do have this. I mean, one is. Uh, I mean, has growing size, the cycle, but it's still, yeah, it's, yeah, uh-huh. Okay, so yeah, as Isaac said, uh, I've already given you <laughs> examples of this. Um, so we had, I, I claimed that SL3Q was generated by um, these subgroups, uh, Xi of t is t ranges over the degree one elements of a field. And actually, these subgroups exactly for this construction, we're going to take, we're going to look at the subgroup, the subgroups generated by any two out of, uh, by any two out of three of these subgroups, okay? So you pick two, Two of those three forms of matrices, and just take pro take arbitrary products of them, and uh, Is you it clear get, to have longer time? Uh, it's not hard to show. I, I'll claim that in a, a, a very shortly, um, but yeah. So it, the number of specific family you're talking about is P constant number. Exactly. And the number of elements in this group is something like these squares. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, as, yep. So, as you, you're saying, um, like when you explicitly look at this subgroup H1, it is um, the upper unitriangular matrices where the entries just above the diagonal can be arbitrary like, degree at most one polynomials, and the entry in the upper right hand corner can be some arbitrary degree at most two polynomials. And similarly, uh, H2 and H3 are uh, conjugates of the subgroup, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so the size of, of each subgroup is going to be like, is going to be P to the seven, uh, but the size of the group, the special, the special linear group grows like Q to the eight, okay? Uh, which is equal to P to the eight M. And so, yeah, so for fixed P and growing M, we have these small subgroups generating this growing, growing group. Okay, so what are the links? So we're going to consider the coset complex 
where G is a special linear group, uh, and H1, H2, and H3 are these subgroups. So what are the links of some cosi um, in this complex, or the vertex in this complex? Um, so let's take some vertex corresponding to a coset G. Uh, and it turns out that links in these coset complexes have, can be described very nicely. So the link of this, of this uh, coset, or, or this vertex, is going to be the graph uh, whose vertex set are the, the vertex set is going to be the cosets of the intersection of H1 and H2. Uh, so this is some subgroup, and this is some subgroup of H1. And another subgroup is H1 intersected with H3. So we look at cosets of these two subgroups inside of H1. Uh, and we draw an edge between two cosets whenever they have some intersection. So it's, it's just like we were doing before with uh, triangles. But now it's a graph. And it's going to be a bipartite graph. Uh, so concretely, we'll have that H1 was this subgroup, and then H1 intersected with H2, we'll just have one arbitrary linear polynomial in the uh, 1, 2 entry. And similarly, uh, H1 intersected with H3 has this form. Okay, now there's a little bit of unpacking to do, but the this bipartite graph is a very simple description. So we can index the, the left and right hand vertices of this graph with pairs of polynomials, specifically with a linear polynomial, a degree at most one polynomial, and a quadratic degree at most two polynomial. Okay, so we're going to have, uh, we have p to the five vertices on each side. Okay, And it turns out that the condition for when two vertices are adjacent, uh, vertex LL comma QL will be adjacent to a right-hand vertex LR comma QR exactly when the product of the two, the two linear components is equal to the sum of the quadratic components. Mm -hmm. Just to clarify, when you say the link is this is all up to us north, this yeah. in particular, every link is up to north for every vertex. Yeah, it turns out. Um, yeah, it turns out that it, for this complex, all of the all of the links are actually isomorphic. This isn't. Um, it's like a vertex or whatever equivalent transitive graph. Yeah. That's some. Yeah. Um, if I take Pandas with one side of here and just have Pandas, is that like a, is that the important fact that it only gets one side? Oh, no. No, it's, it's not. Um, yeah, so, yeah. Uh, I mean, this construction happens to be bipartite. Uh, yeah. Um, but, I mean, in general, this, uh, from these kinds of constructions, you, you can get two-sided, like spectral, uh, high-dimensional expanders. So, yeah. Um, okay, so a, a good idea, if you have a bipartite graph and you would like to understand its spectrum, a, a good thing to do is to look at the squared graph. So the graph whose vertex set is just going to be the vertex set for your original graph but you draw an edge between uh, every pair of vertices whenever you have a path of length two between them. Um, and, and you're going to just look at what's happening with uh, one half of the vertices in the bipartition. Because, so this graph turns out the, all the eigenvalues of its adjacency matrix are just the eigenvalues of its adjacency matrix are just the squares of the eigenvalues of the original graph. 
So um, the picture of this graph is this. And it follows from this edge condition that we can parameterize the neighbors of a vertex on the left, uh, LL comma QL, um, by all pairs, all these pairs of polynomials of the form L prime, uh, L times L prime, LL times L prime minus QL for any L prime, any degree at most one polynomial L prime. And this shows that there are, uh, this is a P squared regular graph because you have P squared choices for L prime. And that's the, that's the largest eigenvalue in this graph. Okay. And I mean, you can repeat this, use this fact again to get that the neighbors of the neighbors uh, have the form L double prime, L prime comma L prime times L double prime minus L times L prime plus Q uh, for any degree at most one polynomial L double prime. Okay, so that is to say, uh, in when you square the graph and restrict to the left-hand side vertices, uh, the the neighbors of some vertex L comma Q uh, are given by you take your L comma Q and you add to it this um, this thing here, L double prime minus L, L prime, L times L double prime minus L, L prime, uh, which, okay, you can just like reparameterize things. And it's from your, from your vertex, your neighbors in the squared graph are given by going to L double prime comma, L prime times L double prime for all uh, L prime and L double prime that are linear. So you have edges for each of these things. Okay, it's kind of a mouthful. Uh, now, the, the key observation now is that this is actually the Cayley graph of an abelian group. Um, so because, I mean, the, the graph is the form like from a given vertex and a vertex, you can just view the coefficients of the polynomial uh, to see that if you could just identify the coefficients of the polynomial with some of the polynomials with some vector in FP to the five. Um, so because the graph has the form like from a vertex, you just add, there's just some set of things that you add to it that don't depend on you know, what vertex you're at now. Uh, I mean, this, this is a Cayley graph of an abelian group. And this turns out to be very nice, as we'll see in a second. So just to be a little more explicit about it, uh, if, you, if your vertex L is given by A0 plus A1x and Q is equal to B0 plus B1x plus B2x squared, um, then you can parameterize your neighbors as follows. I'm just writing everything out. Uh, so, so uh, you know, if you identify this vertex with something in FP to the five, it's given by something with the coordinates a zero comma a one comma b zero comma b one comma b two, and the generating set for this Cayley graph is the set of all elements in FP to the five uh, of, of this form. So you get this just by multiplying out this term here. Um, and the point of this is that the eigenvalues of the Cayley graph of an abelian group have a very nice form. Uh, they're given by these things called character sums. So we can describe all the eigenvalues as follows. So for all vectors r1 through r5 in fp to the 5, um, we get an eigenvalue, uh, we'll have a corresponding eigenvalue equal to the sum over all of the generators in the Cayley graph of uh, a primitive p root of unity to the power of the dot product of this vector r with this generator. 
So this, this gives all the eigenvalues, it turns out, for the Cayley graph of an abelian group. Um, in particular, this one. Um, so if we just use this fact and the fact that this is the generating set, we, um, we, we have that all the eigenvalues are given by sums of, of this following form where R1 through R5 are some fixed elements in FP. Okay, so from now on, imagine R1 through R5 are fixed. Now we can just re rewrite this sum a little bit um, by defining these two polynomials, F and G, which are polynomials in these variables, uh, X2. So the previous sum uh, is equal to this. Okay, and now we're going to consider what this can be. So if F and G are both zero, meaning that R1, R2 through R5 are all zero, then this is just equal to P to the four. Okay, we're just, because each, the inside sum is just one in all cases. Otherwise, let's suppose that they're not both zero, F and G are not both zero. Without loss of generality, let's say it's F that's not zero. And now we'll start by rewriting the sum uh, by, by first summing over X1, X2, and Z2, and then uh, splitting, uh, and then uh, splitting apart this uh, inner sum into a product of two sums, uh, one sum over Z1, and one sum over X1. Okay, and we, we wanna say that this is not big. And um, so now uh, what could happen? Well, if what happens when X2 and Z2, when F and G both vanish on X2 and Z2, um, so in this case, I mean, each of these sums is just going to be equal to P. Okay. Uh, if they're not both zero, if F and G don't both vanish on this point X2, Z2, then one of these sums is going to be equal to zero because we're just summing these roots of unity, all of the roots of unity in some order. And so this inner sum will be zero. Uh, so this is at most P squared times uh, the number of times that F and G both vanish at a point. Um, which in the worst case, I mean, the worst case is when F is equal to G. Um, so we would just want to bound how many times this polynomial F uh, can vanish. Uh, and re recall F is this, it's some linear polynomial in X2 and Z2. So it can vanish at most P times. And therefore this, uh, this sum, is at most p cubed, and, and it follows that the link in the, so this was in the squared graph. Now in the original graph, we'll have a second largest eigenvalue at most the square root of p cubed, so p to the three halves, which is um, much less than the largest eigenvalue, which was p squared. So as by taking p to be bigger, you can get these links to be as good expanders as you want. Now, it is, it's, it's interesting to note that, uh, yeah, I mean, these, these links, like as you, as you take P bigger, these are not good expander graphs in the usual sense, because they, they don't have bounded degree. They're very dense graphs, actually. Okay, so in this proof, uh, the thing to take away is that, is that ultimately expansion follows from the fact that we had some linear polynomial, it was in two variables and it either vanished. And so it was non-zero and therefore it either vanished everywhere on P squared points or on at most P points. Uh, okay. So we can use this, a similar thing to handle this case uh, 
for this other group that I mentioned, the symplectic group. And what we'll do is we could do a con the construction just like before, where we consider the coset complex uh, using subgroups generated by any two out of three of these kinds of elements. Uh, again, where we restrict the degree of T to be at most one. Okay, and it turns out that like before, all of these three subgroups are going to be some small things, but as M grows, the, this containing group um, grows also. So as an example, uh, the subgroup for H3 is going to look like matrices of the following form. Uh, so it's, it's slightly more complicated now. You have some cubic polynomials showing up. Um, but uh, yeah, you can, by can carrying out the same steps as before, I mean, ultimately the problem that you get to is you want to show, so again, you look at this bipartite graph, you square it, and it turns out you get the Cayley graph of an abelian group. You can use this fact about its eigenvalues, and ultimately you just want to, ultimately you can just use the fact that if you have a quadratic polynomial uh, in two variables, it has at most, it's either identically zero or it has at most two p zeros, which is a special case of the beloved short simple one. Um, so in general, what Ryan and I did is we, we can give a high dimensional expander family for each of these groups called Chevalet groups, um, which, are, we make, which are sort of the bulk of the groups that we type, uh, except for one case. Uh, this is the, the case that corresponds to the exceptional group uh, uh, G2. And I mean, the reason why we can't, why we don't know what to do here is because, well, partially it's because this squared graph is, it's not the Cayley graph of an abelian group, um, but it still seems like it should be a good expander. So for each dimension D, that's at least two. Uh, this gives three new D-dimensional expander families. Um, and we get, uh, for dimensions four, six, seven, and eight, there are these exceptional, some exceptional high dimensional expanders that we get from the exceptional groups of lead type. Uh, and we, we pick these subgroups. Um, we, don't, we don't really think of things in terms of matrices, but um, in terms of generators and relations of these Chevalet groups, and we pick these subgroups uh, according to these things called brute systems. Um, yeah, so in conclusion, um, there's, you can produce simplicial complexes by taking a group and a choice of subgroups. Um, and these groups of Lie type are a good way, using this thing with groups of Lie type is a good way of producing high dimensional expander families. Um, another takeaway is that if you ever have to analyze the spectrum of a Cayley graph of an abelian group, uh, you're in a good situation. Uh, and a final thing to take away is that the, the, at the end of the day, um, like the eye, showing that a graph was an expander, I mean, is showing that there's some, the, the eigenvalues are, are either some big thing or some small thing. Um, this is just like if you have a non-zero polynomial, uh, it's either zero a lot of the times, like all the time, or almost none of the time. Okay, and uh, that was it. Thanks. Yep. Oh. Oh, good question. Yeah, uh, it's not really, it does, and, and that's not extremely important that they're simple. And I don't think it's important at all, actually. It's just sort of, uh, yeah, I should have said it's like, it's like a natural kind of place to start. Although it's actually not where we started. But yeah. But, but for dealing with, you can't get the standard degree at all. 
Yeah, you can't because yeah, if you take three subgroups, I mean, take three subgroups and just like take some word, some product of the generators in some order, you could always like reorder it so that you have a product of something in the, fir the first subgroup, a product of something in the second subgroup, and so on. So that, uh, I mean, the, the size of the thing they generate isn't much bigger than any of the original things. Yeah. Yep. Um, so this construction seems to heavily use the like degree one or less. Uh huh. Is yeah. There, is there any other like, like you wouldn't be a subgroup, but subset or generated subset of F2 that would also have similar properties? Yeah. No, you could, I mean, you could say degree in most anything, for example. Uh, I, I guess I'm wondering the, things that are degree. Yeah, I'm not sure. I haven't thought about that, but yeah. I think it's something that, like, uh, they even try to define these, like, symbols and like, groups over a ring. Mm -hmm. You can look at subrings, and uh, it's very complicated. You started going down this route. Yeah. You can go down the route, but um, it's possible now. Yeah, I mean, if you had like a graded ring, you could do something like this, like the same thing as this, basically. Um, and then the other part is, um, what do people sort of look at for like the attractive qualities of expanders? Like explicit, obviously, is important, and uh, good expansion is important. Yeah. Are there other properties? Uh, yeah. So there is this thing I mentioned about locally testable codes. And I don't know much about this, but I know that people are very interested in like highly symmetric uh, complexes. So that's one thing, like having a lot of symmetries. Um, mm -hmm. This kind of stuff has been used before, for example, is it like an open question whether the astrologically good binary codes that are also tickets, like the code spaces in band are tickets. Mm -hmm. And those result positively using some similar idea of expanders oh. and special additional things you're talking about. Wait, the cyclic code problem or yeah. oh recently? Wait. Oh wow. I Wait, was it completely resolved? It... Yeah, probably, huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Huh. Uh, yeah. So all of this, the trace in terms of these uh, two degree, these two dimensional expanders, mm -hmm. but I assume your construction works fine for arbitrary dimension, but just could be more uh, subgroups. Yeah, yeah. So you could do this coset complex thing, but with more subgroups. Um, and I mean, in the case of when you have like the special linear group, this just corresponds to taking like bigger matrices. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. But the constructions that people actually use, do they want like arbitrary dimensional expanders or just like more than that? Uh, I know a lot of the times people care about, or sometimes I know people care about like growing dimension expanders. And, and also sometimes people care about like having the best like sort of gap ha having the best gap possible uh, for this for these walks for these walks on the faces as the dimension is growing. Right. 